A long, long time ago, there were three legendary brothers called Lek, Chek, and Roos. The three brothers went on a hunting trip together and stalked different animals in different directions. Lek went north, Chek went west, and Roos went to the east. The three brothers founded their own countries in the places that they ended up. You see where this is going, right? Different countries tell different versions of the story, but Czech started the Czech people and ended up as the Czech Republic. Rus started the Rus people and ended up as Russia. And Lech was, according to legend, the founder of Poland. They say he founded Poland here after witnessing the glorious sunset and white eagles flying around. The Polish flag today represents this very sunset. All right, I know what you're thinking. What the hell happened to the name Lech? Lech started the Lechites, and indeed Poland used to be called Lechia because of this. In early European history, the Roman civilization was the embodiment of Christianity, and Christianity meant civilization. To be formally introduced as a player in European history pretty much meant that your country adopted Christianity. If not, well, you were a barbarian that deserved some crusading. Around the time that the title Emperor of West Rome passed on to the Germanic people and the Holy Roman Empire was established. The tribes east of the empire in the Lechia region were still uncivilized because they believed in different religions. One of those tribes, the Poles, became the catalyst for government systems. With the chief of the Poles, Miezeko I, officially being baptized in 966 AD, Poland makes its first appearance into European history as the Duchy of Poland. Alas, it's going to go through several cycles of deletion and creation over the next centuries. Let's set sail for Poland, the tragic country. <laughs> the Duchy of Poland was officially recognized as a member of the European world. Unfortunately, it was forced to immediately play tower defense against the feudal lords from the Holy Roman Empire. Meanwhile, they tenaciously conquered territory up to the Baltic coast and the Kiev regions, building the foundations for a country. Finally, Bolshaw I the Brave, son of Miezko I, elevated this humble duchy to a proper kingdom. It even started to spread Catholicism to the infidel natives in the Baltics. Unfortunately, the princes went all Game of Thrones on each other and split the country up among themselves into humble duchies once again. Divided Poland lost control of the Baltic Sea and was forced back inland wielding the age-old Cassus Belli of we're saving your soul by forcing you to adopt Christianity. You know what's coming. The fucking Crusades. The Catholic Knights flocked here, most of them being Germans from the Holy Roman Empire. They built up fortresses here, evicted the natives, and claimed this land for themselves. What else would Jesus do? The Polish dukes were unable to come together, you see. One of them, the duke of a region called Masovia, fucks up big time. He officially requested the help of the Teutonic Order to exterminate the Baltic natives in their front yard. Sure, the Teutonic Order gladly crusaded the, well, hell out of these native infidels, but then they just squatted here and created a new crusade country with the Livionian Brothers of the Sword. The Polish Dukes didn't dare to speak up in case they pissed off the Pope. After all, the crusade country is claiming to squat here and spread the holy word of God for all eternity, and it would be heresy to disagree with this, right? They had no choice but to just let this German country pop up in the north. I hope you're getting bad vibes already. Poland finally got their shit together in the 13th century, settling their differences and uniting. If you watch this channel, the 13th century should give you very bad vibes. Here comes the unprecedented day of judgment, the Mongol Stampede. In 1206, the Mongol Empire eviscerated Central Asia and pressed the attack to invade the Rus tribes. The proud Kiev duchy was trampled into the ground, the traumatized survivors fleeing into the Kingdom of Hungary, and the end of the world by the hands of the demonic horsemen was imminent. The Mongol forces finally arrived at the Carpathian Mountains in 1241, and you bet that Poland, Hungary, and the Holy Roman Empire were pissing their pants in absolute terror. The Mongolian army wanted to stabilize its flank before properly invading Hungary. Well, that meant that Poland was fucked. The capital, Krakow, was overrun instantly, and Warsaw also died soon after. The Mongols invaded deep, all the way into the Silesia region, before the Polish duchies finally understood the severity of their situation. Their entire civilization could literally be deleted here. Time to fight. Everybody knew that Poland was just the beginning. 
Hungary and even the Teutonic Order put aside their puny differences and sent reinforcements. In Legnesia Silesia, the desperate last stand for survival against the Mongol hordes ignited. But the Mongols were just too strong. Over 10,000 soldiers were snapped out of existence along with the Duke of Silesia, Henrik II. There was nothing left to unite over. The Mongolian horde, thankfully, went away on their own because of their own internal conflicts without directly ruling Poland. But this wasn't the end of their struggles by any means. The Mongols kept sending wave after wave of invaders, and the opportunistic Teutonic Order backstabbed and attacked once more now that the imminent Mongol threat was over. It was pretty much anarchy. The local nobility warlords greedily extracted every pound of flesh from their peasants while Silesia was annexed by Bohemia. A unified Poland was completely out of the question until the Mongols finally fucked off for good in 1287. In 1333, Casimir III the Great rose to the throne, united the divided duchies, crippled the power of the nobility warlords, and enacted several revolutionary policies to rebuild his country from the rubble. There was a good reason why Casimir III the Great was called the Great. He was an absolute beast at diplomacy. He conquered Galicia, a part of the fallen Kiev duchy, and donated the Silesia region to Bohemia as a practical diplomat. I mean, Bohemia was going to take it regardless, so might as well salvage some cookie points, right? The real problem was the backstabbing fuckers of the Teutonic Order. Casimir buddy buddies up with the Grand Duchy of Lithuania to make them think twice before they pull some chicanery. You see, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania was a country founded by Baltic natives, and they didn't believe in any of that Christianity nonsense yet. The Teutonic Order was moralizing and shoving them around for being infidels, and so, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Do you see how difficult of a situation Poland is in right now? They have to keep up the appearance of being devout Catholics to stay in the favor of the Holy Roman Empire before they send in another crusade, but their best friend is also a staunch infidel. Poland takes the masterful middle road and sends in missionaries to Lithuania to make a half-assed attempt to spread the holy gospel of God. Meanwhile, Poland also donates half of the recently conquered Galicia region to not antagonize the infidels. Alas, no king rules forever, and the stability he built died with Casimir III the Great. Casimir had no son. The next in line to rule Poland was his niece called Jadwiga. Yeah, Jadwiga was female, which was a big no-no at the time. But most importantly, she was only 12 years old. Poland just barely climbed out of the abyss of the recycling bin, but it looked like they were about to get banished into clusterfuck territory yet again. In this time of great crisis, Lithuania pulls the ultimate bro move and repays its debt by becoming the knight in shining armor. You see, they're both scared shitless of the Teutonic Order and its dreadful purge infidels move. Lithuania suggests to just merge kingdoms. Poland accepts, on the condition that Lithuania officially converts to Catholicism. Lithuania says whatever, and in 1386, the Grand Duke of Lithuania, Yugalia, marries Queen Jadwiga. Poland teamed up with Lithuania, now stronger than ever, and decides to finally kick the shit out of the cancerous Teutonic Order once and for all. On July 15th of 1410, they throw everything they have to get out under the thumb of these religious scourges in an epic showdown at the Battle of Grunwald. The Teutonic Order was finally defeated. The moment of glory for Poland is finally approaching. This is what all its struggles were for. The Polish-Lithuanian alliance recruited other Christian nations to hold the line against the growing threat of the Ottoman Empire. They also, ironically, forged an alliance with the Mongolian Golden Horde to give Russia a satisfying kick in the nuts. Poland was the new sheriff in town, and of course they took this opportunity to grief the neighboring noob countries just because they could. With this newfound power, you know that they just had to act on their centuries of resentment against the Teutonic Order. Poland punched them so hard that the Teutonic Order got annexed into Poland. Russia is obviously now in 2022, a country that doesn't easily turn the other cheek. You should check out our video on the history of Russia to fully understand why Russia is so aggressive. A monstrously resentful Russia attacked Lithuania in 1487, and Lithuania was about to just completely die by the mid-1500s. Poland and Lithuania decided to completely merge governments in 1569 with the Union of Lublin to stay alive. Born again as the mighty Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, 
They were the rising superpower in East Europe. Their primary military strength came from the Ukrainian Cossacks and the Baltic Hussar horsemen. The era of the horsemen is here. This Polish light cavalry army is the famous winged Hussar. In the Polish terrain, mostly made up of flat plains, the deadly winged Hussars soared around like their namesake, even ravishing the Ottoman-controlled Crimean Peninsula and Russian-controlled Moscow like a dragon. The winged Hussars' unstoppable charge empowered the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth as the godfather of East Europe. Alas, times were changing, the modern era was coming up, and it's time for Poland to fall from grace yet again. The newer neighboring countries were centralizing and establishing better systems of government. Poland, a country whose nobility always had a concerningly strong influence over central command, was unable to adapt to the changing times and establish a stronger centralized government. They completely missed out on the chance to modernize their politics, economy, and military. The advance of gunpowder meant that the winged hussars started to get shot out of the sky more and more, and the antiquated system of serfdom meant that the still medieval Poland produced less stuff compared to other countries. The Teutonic Order, don't forget about them, evolved into the Duchy of Prussia and was just waiting for the opportunity to declare independence and get out. Finally, in the mid-1600s, Poland starts its inevitable downhill trajectory yet again. You see, the Ukrainian Cossacks rebelled against the Polish nobility's oppression and excessive taxation. Russia, still grinding its axe that never forgets, couldn't resist but to take this cheap shot. To make matters worse, even Sweden invaded from the north. The double-edged sword of the Polish plains, oh so convenient when Poland had an unstoppable light cavalry, also meant that Poland had no way to defend itself when shit hit the fan and everybody turned hostile. Because enemies were pouring in from every single direction, Polish history refers to this period of time as the Deluge or Giant Flood. Polish strategic strongholds were all overrun and even the once subdued Teutonic Order, now Prussia, successfully went rogue and declared independence. The proud Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth that was on top of the world was now forced back into its tiny box of an anxious, brittle nation. The Polish military was, well, very sad about this whole situation. It was ganged up on by Prussia, Austria, Russia, and the Ottoman Empire, and pretty much died. Treated only as a pitiful buffer zone, the neighboring countries were more than happy to make Poland eat all the collateral damage. In the mid-1700s, Russia punched the lights out of Sweden and ripped away the Baltic Sea. Russia was now also winning the slugfest against the Ottoman Empire, cheerfully gobbling up the Balkans. Things look really dire right now in East Europe, and it's clear that Austria is next. Prussia is really starting to panic. Coincidentally, an anti-Russian revolt erupted in Poland, and Prussia enacts this masterwork of diplomacy to feast on their sorrow. Prussia tells Russia, All right, look here. You might as well just fucking invade Poland because of this incident. And Russia loves that idea. Austria will also chip in and rob Poland of the southern regions, while Prussia would just claim some leftover territory. In 1772, this deal was executed, and all three countries flooded in to invade Poland instantaneously. This is the first partition of Poland. Poland's capital was already overrun, so Poland had no choice but to just let it happen. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth feel it in their bones that their entire existence is about to get deleted. They swallow their pride and desperately broker an alliance with their local devil, Prussia, to try to stop the Russian advance. They realize their mistake now. The nobility had too much power. Retroactively trying to unfuck themselves, government policies limiting the power of nobility were hastily enacted. How do you think the nobility reacted to this? Yep, they just switched sides and actively helped the Russians plunder Poland. Their untrusty ally, Prussia, of course, sat back and watched as Poland went up in flames. In 1793, Prussia and Russia suddenly decided that they were cool after all and divvy up Poland yet again. This unfortunate incident is the second partition of Poland. Whatever reform Poland attempted went out the window. Poland was barely hanging on to the small territory it was allowed to have left. Poland sees that the end is near. Brave Polish insurgents, unwilling to accept this doomed fate, rise up in rebellion, but they just made matters worse. You see, they just served the hostile neighboring nations a bulletproof justification for war on a silver platter. Prussia, Russia, and Austria gleefully answer this cast spell and invade Poland, splitting the remaining territory among themselves. 
1795, Poland was completely deleted from the world map. This is the third and last partition of Poland because, you know, there was no more Poland left for partitioning. Napoleon made his earth-shattering rise in 1806 and blasted Poland's worst enemies, Prussia, Austria, and Russia, into a coma. The Poles, now literally countryless, tried to assist Napoleon and fight towards independence by seizing this moment and revolting as insurgents. Prussia retreated from Poland in 1807, Austria followed suit in 1809, and Poland finally won its independence again as the Duchy of Warsaw. The Poles vitriolically joined Napoleon in his invasion against Russia, hoping to return some of the pain. Well, you know how this goes. Their invasion dragged on until winter, the Russian cold killed just about everyone, and Napoleon got exiled. The Congress of Vienna, a meeting meant to discuss how do we fuck France, also decided to delete the Duchy of Warsaw again out of spite. In 1815, not even a decade after hard-earned independence, the partition of the Duchy of Poland was enacted and Poland just ceased to exist for the next hundred years. A century later in 1914, World War I started and the whole region of Poland became a brutal, bloody battleground for German and Russian soldiers. The Polish conscripts caught up in the middle were tragically forced to kill their own fellow Poles in a war that they had nothing to do with. With Germany's surrender in 1918, Poland finally won independence yet again after 123 years. You know what happens next, right? Hitler of Nazi Germany wanted to attack France, and Stalin of the Soviet Union wanted to not have a war with Germany again. The two countries came to the compromise of, let's invade Poland together, as a term for their non-aggression pact. In 1939, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union invaded Poland in unison, and Poland was deleted from existence yet again. In the aftermath of World War II, the Soviet Union forced Poland to adopt communism. Born again as the Polish People's Republic, Poland spent most of the remainder of the 20th century as a satellite country for the Soviet Union. 21st century Poland, a war-torn country with a history of casually being erased from existence, is determined to not let that happen again. They understandably don't take any half measures with their military spending. Poland is now a proud country of the first world and preparing against Russian aggression, almost as if they know what it's like to lose a country, multiple times. As of October of 2022, Poland is one of Ukraine's biggest supporters in its war against Russia. Not only have they welcomed millions of Ukrainian refugees, they're doing everything possible to supply Ukraine with the weapons and logistics it so desperately needs. After all, as far as Poland is concerned, they're next after Ukraine and they would much rather not have a war on Polish territory again. Even going as far to supply a staggering $1.7 billion worth of military equipment, Way out of proportion considering Poland's GDP, Poland is gritting its teeth and antagonizing Russia by supplying Ukraine with everything they need to fight a war. What about the other side of the story? Why is Russia making us anxious about a literal nuclear apocalypse? Check out our video on the history of Russia to learn about the historical and geographical context behind Russia's actions beyond a convenient hand wavy Putin is evil. This has been your Captain David Bradford from Knowledge Raiders, and please share this video with friends if you liked it.